Like it's huh. like using it to control something because that's a, that's you control of a machine. <laughs> 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 you know, that's One giant incremental. Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. Super excited to talk about brain computer interfaces democratized. We have Connor Rusimano joining us on the show. Hello. Thank you, Alan. It's great to be here. Thanks so much for coming on. I'm super excited. Yeah. Huge congrats on all the progress you've made with OpenBCI. The video that we just watched was so cool, where even young kids are now being able to control things like these robotic arms with their brain waves. Yeah. That's so, so, so cool. For those that don't know Connor's background, he's co-founder and CEO of OpenBCI, which produces and sells open source brain computer interfaces. He's also a research affiliate at MIT Media Lab, and you can find the links in the bio below, openbci.com, as well as their Twitter, OpenBCI. Connor, let's start things off with one of our favorite questions to ask our guests. What are your thoughts on the direction of our world? Thoughts on the direction of our world? Um, well, I, I think that humanity is pretty cool. I think that we do some amazing things, but I also think that um, we are, um, you know, we're, we're also vulnerable to ourselves. So, you know, we need to, as we build things like brain computer interfaces and technology that are, you know, where the implications are great and, and somewhat of a double edged sword, we have to be very smart about uh, staking out the, the, the scenarios that we don't want to end up in and designing around them. So, that's kind of, you know, a lot of the impetus of what we do is just making sure that brain computer interfaces are brought into the world in a, uh, in a way that is beneficial to humanity and not detrimental. So, yeah. Yep. yeah. So, so out of all the future cases of potential trajectories of civilization, it's like staking out the ones that um, are negative and, and making sure double, triple, quadruple checking to make sure that we're not going to yep. endeavor into those. That's a, that's a great way to put it. Um, Okay, let's talk about the journey. Born in New Jersey, grew up in Virginia, ended up going to Parsons in Columbia. Mm -hmm. So teach us about who you were as a kid and what got you interested in science and technology. Oof. Um, as a kid, um, I always really loved art. I always loved drawing um, and building little things with my hands. I actually really didn't get into computer science or electronics until grad school. Mm. Um, but I always, you know, I loved painting little like models and, and, and things like that and, and always loved pencil drawing. Um, and then, you know, uh, in high school, I went to a science and tech high school that was very focused on uh, math, science, engineering, um, you know, and then ended up going to Columbia to study civil engineering. Uh, but when I was there, I discovered like uh, 3D modeling and design and um, you know, that kind of took me, you know, as, throughout college, I, I, I realized that I really love design and I love art. Um, and I had to like be in a dry, you know, engineering degree where I was learning about digging holes in the ground to like realize, okay, like I need, I need a little bit more creativity and art in my life. Yeah. Um, you know, later on, I realized that digging holes in the ground is very important. You know, like th it, at, the, at the core of any um, masterful tool or, or beautiful, you know, uh, usable, uh, scalable product is a foundation. Like you really need foundational thinking and foundational design to, to build something that's scalable. So I think later on I started to appreciate my civil engineering degree and like yeah, the yeah. value oh, of yeah. digging a hole in the ground. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. <laughs> so it's such a valuable piece of, yeah. of you know, the component to what you're now able to do with that engineering background. Yeah. Yeah. And also art. Um, I want to I want you to teach us about the story um, of also what triggered um, you to pursue this, um, which was um, the rug, the, in, the injury that you had playing rugby. Right. So. Um, yeah, you know, I'll touch on childhood again. My my nickname as a kid was uh, Kamikaze Connor, <laughs> so um, I was like pretty um, fearless, and you know would pretty much just run into walls and like see like all right, so the wall is stronger than I am. Okay, <laughs> good, noted. No. Um, but that you know, I, I really loved contact sports. So in high school, I played football, and then I was recruited to Columbia to play college football. Um, ended up switching over to rugby, but you know, like sports that, you know, require you to run into heavy objects quickly. Um, and over the course of like four or five years, I sustained a number of pretty serious concussions, um, which, you know, started to take, you know, started to take its 
toll on me both physically and mentally. Um, so by senior year of college, I was, um, you know, pretty depressed. I was having trouble focusing in school, um, you know, somewhat bipolar in the sense that like I would go from, you know, manic highs to lows. Um, and so that was actually the first time that I really started getting interested in the brain. It was like somewhat of a selfish thing because I was like, hey, what's going on here? I, yeah. I damaged the hardware and the software. I feel the effect. Like I feel my ability to, like my lack of ability to think the way that I used to. And so that was the first time I really started getting introspective about, you know, mind versus brain and the hardware and the software. And when I say hardware, I mean like the brain versus your mind um, being the software. Um, so then, um, oh, interesting brain meaning the physical, uh, okay, organ, and then a mind meaning the the software that the the felt sense of being. Right. That's kind of, I like to use that analogy where you've got like you know your brain is the hardware and then your mind is the software, but they okay. you know you can't have one without the other. Yeah, yeah. Or actually, you could probably have a brain, but you can't have a mind without a brain. Yeah, I don't think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to be determined. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, and were you, were you, is this, is this when you were um, uh, doing the, adju the adjunct uh, professorship with uh, per Parsons and NYU? So I actually like after Columbia, I, want, I, I made the decision I want to get back into des to design, I want to get back into art. Um, I ended up going to Parsons with the intention of pursuing a design degree and, and learning how to write code for 3D modeling. I was really into mm -hmm. Maya and 3D design. Um, and then at Parsons, I was in a design and technology program and still dealing with the side effects of the concussions. Um, and then I, d I took a physical computing class learning how to use an Arduino mm -hmm. um, and found this tutorial. To this date, it's like the coolest tutorial oh, on the yeah. internet. Yeah, yeah. It's, it was called How to Hack Toy EEGs, nice. um, done by the frontier nerds of yeah. NYU ITP, which is where I ended up teaching later on. Sweet. Um, but like in a day, I learned how to like crack apart this little Mindflex EEG toy. Like Mattel had built this toy mm. with a single EEG sensor mm -hmm. inside of it. Uh, and at the time, I did not know what EEG was. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine was just like, hey, I think you'd be interested you in this. Be. And he like, would you want to buy this toy from me for $40? And I was like, all right, sure. And he's like, yeah, you should just check out this tutorial. Um, I don't know why he did that, but it you know, definitely made a huge impact on my life. because. I love that. On a, like Saturday morning, I woke up and I was like, all right, I gotta do this project. I, I like put this thing on, I crack it open, I, t I tap the serial into an Arduino, and then I follow you know, this tutorial and with, like, within a couple hours, I'm looking at my brain waves on a screen. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, From uh, one sensor. One the sensor. One, yeah. But then I also was like, all right, whatever, who, you know, how, is this real? In one day, you're seeing the brain waves. In one day, I'm yeah. seeing the brain waves. Um, and then I realized like, you know, there was this one little bar graph tied to like your focus, you know, and mm -hmm. there's like a mm -hmm. kind of a generic classifier that takes your raw EEG and your band power and translate it, translates it into a focus metric. And I was like, this is bogus, this isn't gonna work. But then I like, you know, I started messing with it and I started to feel the connection. I was like, wait a minute, like there, there's something here. Like I can make this bar go up. I'm not sure why it does, mm. but I feel like something in my mind feels the connection and then I, it would drop and I, I would know before it was about to drop that it was about to drop. Because mm -hmm. um, you'd lost your focus. Because I'd lost my focus and I'm like, oh, there is something here. So I spent like, like until like six hours, like from the moment I finished the exam or the, the tutorial <laughs> till like way past my bedtime, I was just like, trying to move this bar graph up yeah, and down yeah, with yeah. my mind. And I'm like, I think I'm getting it. I yeah. think I'm getting it. Um, but that was like, a, you know, love at first sight moment. It's um, like what else can we control like that? Yeah, yeah. My mind was just like, boom, yeah. this is crazy. Um, mainly, you know, like there was the selfish, you know, having the concussions and being really curious about how I could help myself. Um, you know, I had been to like neurologists and psychologists and they were like, here, take some pills. And I was like, nah, nah. Like, not, not really. I don't like, I'd rather yeah. like, you know, make that decision carefully. Um, yeah. Is there anything else we can do? Yeah. Um, but at the same time, um, my grandma was suffering from a neurodegenerative disease mm. uh, called Pick's disease. It's like a similar to Alzheimer's. Mm. It was a really rapid onset dementia. So it was really, you know, the mind and the brain was really close to my heart at that time. Yeah. Um, and then shortly after I discovered EEG, one of my best friends and a, and a, a friend that I played rugby with um, suffered a really severe neck injury and was like paralyzed from the neck down. Um, 
And luckily, he, he made a, he, like for three months, he was fully paralyzed from the neck down, but he made a miraculous recovery wow. to like basically 95% back to where he was. Like walking again? Yep. Wow. And so, you know, he was, he's still to this day one of my best friends. And so, you know, I would go and visit him in the hospital and like, you know, I was there with him when we weren't sure if he was ever going to be able to move his hands again. Um, and then I would visit him every few weeks and, and I slowly watched his nervous system like kind of fix itself. Self, yeah. Um, which, you know, he was really lucky that he didn't sever his spinal cord. He yeah, just, yeah. he just bruised it. Yeah. And the swelling temporarily pinched, pinched the nerve so that like, so that essentially the messages couldn't get through. They were like the highways were, were, were jammed, right? But then over time, the swelling receded and he managed to get the, the highways back, you know, in, in his spine from the neck down. Um, and so, you know, experiencing that second hand with him, you know, obviously it was like very uh, dramatic and, and sad in the beginning. But then as watching him uh, get through this process and regain control of his fingers and his legs to the point where he was like riding a bike again yeah. was incredible and also very impactful in my interest in not just the brain, but the, you know, the electrical highways that run through your body that, that control all of this, mm -hmm. which we take for granted until, a, until something like that happens. Yeah, the body yeah. is a, a divine vessel. Yeah. And yeah, and for, for it, it, we only typically learn about how grateful we are for it after an, an incident. So to have yeah. that ahead of time from a mentor is so important. You, um, your co-founder, Joel Murphy, Yep. Yeah, you guys are really cool. I like how you guys, you know, collaborate and work together. You guys yep. ended up uh, um, seeing at the Maker Fair that what you built was really successful mm -hmm. and that you wanted to go and raise $100,000 on Kickstarter. You raised $215,000 on Kickstarter. Yep. So massively surpassed your goal. And then you started producing this, this neuro revolution. This yep. very affordable hardware that's all 3D printed. Um, and of, the, of course, then there's the electrical stuff as well. But this also open source, yep. which is very cool. And um, we have, uh, you know, we have the little parts video that Ron um, can bring up and show as well. But that, you know, the, it's, quite, uh, it's quite like Legos for yep. the, yeah, you're kind of like the Lego of, uh, e, of like EEG of, of brain. I like to say that, and I, I, yeah. maybe we coined that together. I think at we MIT. did at MIT. At because you know, because I, I say that now is like you know we're yeah. basically we try to be the Lego of neuroscience. You know, yeah. we we want this like building block model where you know we you buy the kit and we tell you how to put it together the first time you use it, but then you're encouraged to disassemble it and plug in different electrodes and accessories and sensors and like build your own neuro castle or pirate ship or you know unicorn or whatever you whatever you, whatever you want it to be it's it's yours after you understand like the core building blocks and how they fit together um, yeah you know and I think that is at least for for research and science and innovation a great model um, you know encouraging intuitive learning and put it together and break it and if it doesn't work then you put it together in a different way and then it, you do that until it works um, so I can download the the CAD file of the uh, of the 3D printed. Uh, it's called the Ultra Cortex. Ultra Cortex. Ultra Cortex is the 3D printed electric headset. Yeah, that's right there. And then the uh, each one of those. Um, Take it off. And then, and then each one of the um, of the th blue there. Yep, we call those the mech parts. Mech parts. Um, those were designed by us to, to fit these little grooves and allow you to kind of twist the nodes so that you can, you know, adjust for comfort and, you know, kind of dial it into your own head si uh, size and shape. Okay. So each of these nodes can be tweaked, you know, and, and at first, if you pop the thing right on, it's, it's not going to be comfortable because we've got these spiky little electrodes that are in there to get through hair. Yeah, to get through but hair. But then, you yeah. know, if, if you really take the time and you adjust it for your head size and shape, like, you know, I've had this on yeah. for the last 15 minutes yeah. and you might see some little Marks, divots yeah. there, but, yeah. you know, 
it works. Got it. So then, so then the the process of 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 screwing in the mech part, you said mech yep. part. Mech part. I mean, it's mech a part. kind of a yeah, screw, star name for it. But. You screw in the mech part until it until the the electrodes actually get through the hair to the actual skull. Yep. Um. To the to the yeah to the um. Skin. Skull cap skin to the yeah. skin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nothing is penetrating the skin. Nothing yeah. penetrates the skin. <laughs> and you can still get enough of a readout of the biosignals um, mm -hmm. from, and then so you can do this from anywhere from, you know, one electrode to how many maximum can you put on there? On this headset, we can do up to 16 channels of 16. EEG. Okay. Um, you know, there are much more expensive EEG systems where you can go up to 256 electrodes, um, but that takes a while to set up. Yeah. So, yeah, 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 yeah. Two hundred fifty-six times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but this is no, um, this is no, uh, um, no conductive gel. Yeah. Uh, needed. Yeah, no gel needed. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then, um, so so I can order that from OpenBCI.com, but I can also take the CAD file and print it myself. Correct. As well, because okay, cool. Yep, so all the hardware designs, including the electronics, we put the Gerber files on there. Um, all, all of the parts here, you can download STLs for 3D printing, you know, or solid part files. Um, yeah, and everything that we design is open source, but it just turns out that most people would rather just buy it, like, you know, pre-built, um, at least for research. But the cool thing is that, you know, we, we, we put these designs out there five years ago, you know, for the electronics, three years ago for the headset. Um, and we've seen in the last three years, you know, new neurotech companies that prototyped with OpenBCI electronics and OpenBCI hardware. That's great. And then just took the schematics, uh, reconfigured them for their own needs, maybe miniaturized things or removed things, uh, and then, you know, launched an entire company, a new startup based on uh, our schematics. And, right. and which, like, you know, a lot of people in your standard, you know, kind of business model would be upset about that. But that's, that was our intention. Like, we wanted to plant these little seeds around the world and, and let these neuro plants grow into a, like, you know, a new industry. Um, yeah. And so that was, you know, that was the goal. And I think that's you know, part of the beauty of, of open source and open hardware yes. is just like, um, you, know, you're, you, know, you might have a harder time raising VC because people are like, where is your IP? But you also, like, we've made a, you know, I like to think we've made a really big impact on the community at large. And, yeah. you know, now we're seeing uh, the, the BCI industry move forward in a very healthy way where innovation is taking place across multiple companies and multiple research institutions. Uh, and it's not just us. Like, there are lots of companies that have made really big contributions to the space of neurotech. Um, when you push the edge of knowledge, you push it with open source, and then you open up the, the continued push, um, and you actually inspire other people to pursue it in an open source way as yep. well. Now, um, Okay, I want to hit on um, uh, a little more on the explanation side of things. So you need um, a six volt AA battery, mm -hmm. um, and that you do. You need that well, to power. Yeah, three point seven to six. Like we have, okay. you know, kind of an input input voltage range. Okay. Um, like this one is actually a three point seven volt lithium ion battery. It's rechargeable behind here. Okay. So um, let's let's t so let's take a look at this. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So so on the back side is we call this the the cyton board the cyton board and this is the the daughter shield which we call the daisy um this the, together they extend the system to 16 channels i only have eight plugged in currently but if i wanted to measure from more locations on the scalp i could plug more electrodes in and i could look at twice as much data at the same time okay um, okay so here is where you plug in each electrode yeah i'll show you okay. you can just pop this off pop that right off so and that then, now we're down that, to just the okay, side. Okay, so that enables you to add another uh, layer of electrodes. Another exactly. sixteen from that as well. Uh, just eight and eight. Oh, eight and eight. Okay, yep. so you have eight right now. Correct. And that adds another eight. Okay, cool. Yep. And then the battery is also inside of here. Yeah, I'll show you. Okay. This is this is kind of the the Lego block model, right? Yeah. So here we go. Okay. Uh, under here, we, so this is our base board, the Cyton. Um, and then behind it is the lithium ion battery. A lithium that, ion battery behind yeah, that. You can okay. see 500 milliamp hours. Okay. 3.7 volts. Okay. And is that re on. does that recharge? Is that re it's does, rechargeable? It's yeah. rechargeable. Wait, wait. Let me yep. see oh, this. So, yeah. so sure. what? Sorry. And what do we have? Noise. And what do we have? Yeah. What do we have here? So this we have. You know, it's 
If you're familiar with Arduino, it's very similar to an Arduino. Back oh, a little, sorry. yeah, yeah. With the, yeah. With the you know, addition of an accelerometer and eight biopotential inputs. So it's really an Arduino that's purposed for measuring electrical data from the body. Um, this, is the, cool. this is the ADS-1299, which is a Texas Instruments chip. Um, and then here we've got the MCU. And then on the back, we have uh, the radio module and an SD card slot. So you can store data locally. Oh, sweet. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's designed to be somewhat portable in the sense that you don't necessarily need to be streaming to the computer. You okay. could be recording to the, to the SD great. card. Okay, so you could just walk around town and uh, record to the SD card and then come home and unpack it yourself. Yeah, and you'll and have a lot of conversations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Try it. If you walk down the street, you won't make it half a block without, oh yeah, sorry. Just uh, won't make half a block with a what? With, without getting a conversation. A conversation. So, oh, like, yeah, yeah, when I, I go to conferences now, yeah. I don't even need a booth because. Yeah, I, I don't even need a booth. Because <laughs> I just wear the headset around and people yeah. walk up to me. Yeah, and yeah. then if I want a break, like if I need to sit down and like take a, take a chill pill, the I you know, I have to take the headset off, or otherwise people just keep asking me like, "What the heck are you wearing, wearing on your head?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. What a yeah. great conversation starter. So you said this Arduino specifically for biosignal processing? Yeah, in a sense. Interesting. And then what is what is specific about that um, Arduino that makes it good for biosignal processing? Well, it's um, you know. The, the MCU is, is bootloaded with Arduino, so we actually upload the code from the Arduino IDE, the integrated, or the, the developer environment. Okay. Um, you know, so, you, so you know, the firmware that's running on this hardware is just an Arduino uh, file with our own library, C++ okay. libraries, okay. you know, kind of uh, compiled and embedded in there. Okay. Um, but then this is what differentiates it, is, is the, the analog to digital converter that's you know, really purposed for uh, EEG measurements. Um, so it does the translation or it takes the analog electricity that's coming out of your head and turns it into zeros and ones so Damn. that a computer can like yeah. do the things. Damn, um, so you can take, that's what, that's what helps you do the analog electrical biosignal to zero to one data that can, you can then visualize on a computer. Exactly, exactly. Damn. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. That process is like a black box to yeah. like me and like likely so many people about how that actually works. Is that that fast Fourier transform? Uh, that's that, later on. That's later the, on. The FFT okay. comes when you when you've got your waves. So like, okay, I'll I'll, I'll start from the, okay. the, the 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 ground or the the kind of the beginning. Do we so, want to show while you? Sure, why don't we do that? Yeah, let's do that. Um, okay, cool. I'll pop this back on. I think I need to probably restart the system. Okay, yeah, Boop. yeah, take, take your time. Do that. Um, okay, cool, cool. So now, okay, so now we're going to do an, a, a live demo. Oh, I also want to mention this along the way while you're doing that. So there's a couple interesting things here. One of them is that this is EEG, which is brain data. You guys also work with EMG, which is muscle data. Yep. You also work with ECG, which is heart data data. Correct. So this is electromuscle muscular grams and electrocardiograms. The electromyography. Oh, looks like there's a problem. <laughs> okay, Google. <laughs> <laughs> the Google, uh, yeah, it's funny. Behinders. It looks like there's a problem. The, the, the software is like crashing, so she she's not wrong. You're not wrong. <laughs> take, yeah, take take your yeah, time. I'm reboot it. Take your time. Huh? It looks like there's, there's a, problem. a problem. Thanks, thanks Thank for you. Yeah, stating yeah, the obvious. Yeah. And it was my the muscular is called a electromyography. Uh, myography, electromyography for muscle, and that's what we saw at the beginning when you saw um, the 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 child with the robotic hand. That was uh, that was giving muscle. That was giving muscular. Correct. Input. Okay. Okay. Oh yeah, and then there's this receiver right here too, right? Yeah. So this is the little dongle, and right now it's giving me some trouble, but I'll figure this out. This is pretty. Yeah. We, we, pretty standard debugging. Okay, and then so this is a USB, and you can just leave it open like this. Mm -hmm. Do without I mean, cover, it's cool. It's kind of part of our aesthetic. You know, it's, it's cool. Like yeah, it's very hackery. Show yeah. the show the guts. Um, and what's, what's, um, oh, so wait, that's not the one, sorry. Oh, okay. No wonder. And then this is receiving the, um, what you are analyzing from here. Correct. So, and this is via, uh, Bluetooth? Um, via Bluetooth, yep. And then you can also do it via Wi Fi. We have a Wi Fi shield that's a little bit problematic, but it does dr drastically increase the data rates. 
Okay. Um, let's see if we. I'm having a hard time finding the Bluetooth port. That's the problem. Let me try this side. Oh, okay, okay. Of course, you know the live demo is great until you want it to. Yeah, we had it all. Show. Yeah, and then we started there unpacking. We all right, the, let's try that again. Okay, cool. Cool. Dun -dun -dun. cool. And we're in. We're in. Okay, cool. Cool. Let's pop that on there. Boop. Boop. All right, and I'm going to join you over cool. look closer to you so that I can also observe while Ron sure. will. Do we have a good shot of the? That's great, yes. All right. Okay, excellent. All right, so, cool. so, so this is your software. You guys also created the software Correct. to be able to visualize what we're seeing. Yep. Okay. And we've got, um, let's see, I'll do, um, so here we have the eight channels that are located, let me go back to the head plot. So. This is kind of a top-down view of my head. My, this is my nose, my very triangular nose. <laughs> uh, channels one, two are on my eyebrow. Okay. So if I start blinking my eyes, you can actually see those EMG spikes in channels one oh, and two. Oh, that's great. You see those? Yeah. Um, if well, I, okay, so we can live, you blink, mm -hmm. and we get spikes. You see oh, that? Oh, wow, yeah, yeah. And I can do a left eye and a right eye. Oh, that's so great. Left eye. It's, it's hard to do one without the other sometimes. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, like, left eye, yeah, that's, that's right eye, left eye, right eye. Nice. There okay. You go. Okay. Left eye, right eye. Um, yeah. So, you know, EMG is much easier to see. You can see, you know, it's, 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 it's a stronger signal yeah, than your brain waves. Muscle, so, like, yeah. if I grip my jaw, my, your jaw is pretty powerful. Powerful, yeah. You can see. That's big. That's a huge All spot. through the head. Yeah. On all the locations. You've got it. Um, and then the fun one. Gosh, this is such a great way to visualize the body. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And I'm sure for kids especially that can be disconnected from the body in today's culture in many ways. Yep. Like to be able to put this on and see them make a movement with their body and see it make something happen on a computer yep. makes a very relatable way of understanding that every little micro movement like that. Yeah. Let's see if I can do like, so this is channel one above my left eye, channel two above my right eye. Channel three is kind of like my left jaw and channel four is my right jaw. Okay. So watch this. See how I have control Whoa. over the four bars? Yeah, so what you were doing there was literally like, you were like squeezing the muscles on your left eye and then on your right eye and then on your right jaw and left jaw. Essentially. Yeah. And so that, you know, that I think is kind of a, like a poor man's version of the future of interaction with computers. Yeah. I think that like the next gen keyboard is gonna be, or, or you know, cursor and mouse will be, you know, highly trained muscles on other parts of our body where we have our hands to still do other things. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. especially in the context of augmented reality and totally virtual reality, right. when we yeah. want to be grabbing things and touching things, yeah. we could theoretically have more inputs than just our fingers. We could be controlling, yes. you know, grabbers and interaction, interaction uh, you know, mechanisms just with muscles on with our forehead muscles. and above our eyes. And this kind of takes us to the Stephen Hawking, yeah, yep. ability to communicate with the muscle movements. Right, so he yeah. needed it, right? Like yeah. he, it was the last, his last method or, or, or technique for communicating, but I think we'll get to a point where, you know, that is uh, more ubiquitous and used in the next generation of, of wearable computers and head mounted displays and things like that. And potentially a greater bandwidth of communication than this language, me vibrating my vocal cords and getting to you. Maybe. Maybe. You know, language is pretty good. The so language uh, is pretty damn good, yeah. yeah. But we can, we can, yeah, we'll see what can. So that was muscle. Yep. Okay. Let me show yes. some brainwaves. Let's keep going. Oh, don't, don't lose me here. So let's go. I'm going to just kind of reconfigure the layout. Okay. So well, that's easy layout reconfiguration. So yeah, this easy. is all open source too. So everything you see here, you can you can look at the guts of the code. You can build your own widgets. Actually, I'll show you. So this is the widget template, and if you want oh, to design, design your, your own, own widget, widget, it'll nice. take you to a, a web page in our docs that shows you kind of like the code needed, and then these are like template drop downs that are you know easy to put new content into. Mm -hmm. um, but let's go back here for this. For, so now I want to show you brainwave. Also the coloration is great as well. That shows the, yeah, the separate, yeah. Yep, That's yeah, great. so yeah, actually, so all of these colors here are mapped to the same channel. And this is the FFT. 
So this is the frequency spectrum. Oh, okay. So basically, now we're gonna get to like the science, you know, the, the 101, okay. the, the, you know, what's actually happening here in terms mm -hmm. of the physics and the, and the electricity and things like that. So okay. um, a battery, right? has a, a pretty constant voltage. It's like, like if you take a multimeter, which is a tool for measuring voltages, you can, you can put it on both sides of the battery and you can see, you know, if it's AA, you'll see 1.5 volts and it'll be steady. Uh, if you take the same tool uh, and put it on the scalp and, and listen in for much, much smaller voltages, that's essentially what we're doing here. We're looking for the voltage between uh, the potential, the electric potential between two different points on the scalp. Mm -hmm. In this case, one of them is my earlobe, which essentially has nothing going on. It's just mm -hmm. like some fatty skin or whatever. I don't know what an earlobe is. Mm -hmm. And then on your brain, you actually have electricity that's being, and, and electrons that are being discharged from uh, connections and neurons in your brain. And sometimes you'll have like a propagation or a wave of electrons that push outward and then they splash against the scalp. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So I like to think of EEG as like this, like we're standing on the beach and the brain is this vast ocean of electricity and these waves are crashing around and splashing and there are these like, you know, things that are happening inside of the brain, like little earthquakes and storms that are generating waves that are crashing on the beach, which is our scalp. Our scalp. And we're standing there and we're watching the waves crash. And then we're trying to make inferences or, yeah. or we're trying to understand what's going on in the middle of the ocean. In the middle of the ocean. Right. Wow. So like if a giant... From just the waves crashing out of the beach. Right. Wow. But like, you know, yeah. if you, if you yeah. extrapolate that analogy, you know, if a tsunami comes, oh, right? Oh, sure, sure. That's a good one. Yeah. Then you're like, oh man, something big must yeah. have happened. Or if, if a hurricane comes and this, this giant swell takes place. Yeah. So that's when, you know, that's what kind of what we're looking for in EEG. We're looking for these abnormalities or a, succes a succession or, or a kind of series of big waves at a certain frequency. And those might be really profound emotional states, like really good flow states or really um, sad, maybe. Right, or states. relaxed or, or calm relaxed. or meditative. Okay. Um, so here, though, like, you know, these are the waves. This is like essentially eight different locations on a beach. And we're looking at the little wave splashing. You know, this is in real time. Oh, okay. Oh, interesting. So then these are different locations on the beach. Got it. And right. That's, got it. And that's the different electrode locations. Exactly. Okay. So like here, you know, we've got the little locations on the beach. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, this isn't, let's see, strength, polarity. Let's go. This little guy's acting up. Oh, there we go. So this is the intensity. Oh, I lied. Anyway, long story short, these are the waves crashing on the beach. And then this graph, what it's doing is it's, it's actually looking at how many waves are splashing per second. So, so okay. it's a frequency. So it's not looking at the strength of the waves per se. It's mm. looking at... Waves per second. Like, and, it, and what it's doing is it's breaking up the, the waves that are splashing into different frequencies. Mm -hmm. um, and so... Now, getting back to the brain, right? If I, if I close my eyes, mm -hmm. my visual cortex, mm -hmm. which is responsible for processing all my visual stimuli, like mm -hmm. the shape of your face, how bright that light is, all this other stuff in the background, that, that plan over there. Um, you know, when my eyes are open, it's processing so much information yes. that all the little neurons are doing different things and they're talking to each other and they're talking to other parts of your brain. So it looks like static. It's like and then if you close your eyes, mm -hmm. all of a sudden, the sensory inputs are not as, uh, you know, they're, they're not there anymore. And so what ends up happening is your brain will return to this like default frequency. In this case, it's an alpha frequency or roughly 10 hertz mm -hmm. on the FFT graph. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you a live demo. And the FFT graph will, will take the biosignals from the, from the scalp and then uh, turn that into what you can see as like a waves per second of exactly. in frequencies. So it'll show you 10 hertz, it'll show you how often. Exactly. Okay. So here, like what I'll end up doing is I'll close my eyes and then here above 10 hertz on this FFT graph, you'll see a spike that okay. correlates to a strength in that frequency. Okay. So the essentially the fact that it, the waves get stronger at that frequency mm -hmm. that'll be reflected here. Okay. 
So let's see if I can do this. And then that also correlates to alpha. It's known as an alpha brainwave. So this bar graph should go up, and then you should see a spike here, particularly in the back of my head, okay. channels 7 and 8, because that's my visual cortex. Oh, yeah, okay. So if you look closely, okay. you'll actually see the waves. Okay. And then you'll see the spike come up, and you'll see the graph go up. Okay. All right? How am I doing? I saw, yeah, alpha go up for a bit, and then, um, yep, yeah, and then I, I, you can read this nuance way better than I can, but um, so you actually you can see them here. If you look there, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten per per second per second. And then ten so waves per second. It's literally like if you if you had yeah. you know if you were listening in there, it'd be like blah, 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 roughly ten per second. Yeah, yeah. And that's why you see this little spike here. It's actually a little bit under ten right now. It's about nine. Oh, okay. And then but alpha is kind of like this whole range here. Yeah. So and there you go. My alpha right now of it's all highest, is yeah. the highest. Yeah, yeah. So these other frequencies are all happening at the same time. Damn, so from an FFT, you can actually be able to see exactly how much beta, theta, alpha, exactly. gamma, delta that is going on in the brain at a given time? Yep, so delta is like 0 to 4 hertz, theta is 4 to 8, alpha is 8 to 12, uh, beta is you know 12 to 30 or 14 yeah. to 30 mm -hmm. um, and you can you know you can kind of adjust these thresholds different people you know sometimes people classify it as like high alpha low alpha mm -hmm. and with more resolution but in general these are the kind of five generic brain wave, brain frequencies or, or uh, power bands as they're referred to and then uh, gamma is everything that's above like 30 Hertz um, one thing that's really cool, mm -hmm. and this is people don't realize this but um, <laughs> that was funny that reset yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so if I turn off this notch filter, this is a really interesting thing to see. Okay. And you gotta wonder what, what, what's happening here. If I extend this up to 120 hertz. So okay. this giant spike here. Yeah, what is that? That is uh, 60 hertz environmental noise that is generated by the fact that in the United States, we operate on a 60 hertz alternating current power grid. Whoa. So every single thing in this room that's powered it's, currently yeah. is, is humming or oscillating on 60 hertz. It is for so sure humming on 60 hertz. Watch if I, if I touch the TV. Watch what happens to that spike. It should go up. Maybe if, if I touch the, the power cord. The power Basically, cable? Basically. The computer? Yeah, if it's plugged in. Anything that is humming on 60 hertz. Okay, yeah, this is a fun one. So it's plugged in and I grab it. Do you see it go up a little bit? Yeah. And then I let go and it'll drop down it a little bit. drops back a little bit. So yeah. anything that's like all this 60 hertz environmental noise, you got to wonder what that's doing to us. Yeah, all like the time. My, yeah. It's, you know, it's picking it up here, right? These yeah. sensors can perceive that 60 hertz noise. Yeah. Um, and we're in it all, all the time. time. Right? Yeah, versus um, being around, yeah, trees and grass and sunlight and... Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So... Connecting to nature. Moral of the story, get outside, kids. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Moral of the story is for sure get outside and... And leave your, your, leave your iPhone behind. Yeah, yeah. Leave your iPhone behind. Connect to the thing that sustains you, our, our planet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So that was um, some of the... That was some of the data around... Um, for when we when we closed our eyes with the um, with the visual cortex, mm -hmm. okay, um, and oh. we also have um, a yep. We I, did it. Okay, I also wanna I, I wanna um, we don't have a robotic hand with us right now. We have mm -hmm. a we have a video that shows um, some of your team that was controlling the oh yeah um, that's the fourth asset, Ronnie. Um, yeah, so some of the team was using the um, the Open BCI technology to control the little walking robots. Oh yeah, yep, yeah, yep. and so that kind of stuff is uh, that's also kind of like you. Vi so you get the opportunity to visualize your biosignal data, 
And then you also get the opportunity to be able to control things that are physical in the world, like the robotic hand we saw at For the sure. beginning, these little robots that your team's controlling there. Yep. Yeah. So walk us through that as well. Sure. So um, basically, you know, like we, with this software, the idea is that you can bring the data in and we've got these little things like, you know, that filter where I turned off the filter and it brought in that huge 60 hertz noise. Mm -hmm. Like we do some work here to get rid of that noise. So we get like a cleaner signal, right? We get rid of the 60 Hertz. Okay. Um, so this software, you know, it will, will generate like the raw data, which has all the noise if you want to look at the noise, but then also we have some signal processing that, that cleans up the data. And then from there, you can, you know, look at this like muscle, these muscle signals that are generated here in, in, the, in the software. And then you can send it out, like basically route it through this software to anywhere you want to send it. So we, we call this the networking widget right here. And essentially within the networking widget, you have the ability to send over serial, LSL, UDP, and OSC, which are four different, you know, kind of networking protocols mm -hmm. or, or means of transacting data between software or hardware. And then you just set up a little, you know, you pick which data type you want. You can pick the time series data, the FFT data, the EMG data, which was those little bar graphs when I was blinking my eyes, the band power, which is like the alpha, beta, gamma, theta, delta, um, and then the focus widget. So I didn't show you that yet. And then you basically pick it. So let's pick FFT. And then you say, okay, I want to send it out over, let's go OSC, FFT, start. And now it's, we've opened up a socket and we're streaming over OSC. To where, where are you? To this address here. Okay. So in, now in any software where you want to Im import an OSC stream or open up the OSC socket as a receiving end, you connect to that address and now you're pulling it into your other software. So you're, so, so anyone can right now be tapping into what your, is happening inside. Right. So this, mind. you know, this software here is now like on my computer, I've opened up that OSC socket and, and with a different application or a different software, we could be listening to the brainwaves and using that to power music or 3D content or in the case of the robot hand. Oh yeah. You know, so in that one, we, we choose the serial outbound. This is kind of like where you can control something that's on the other side of the country or world right. from where you're sitting right now with just your brain. Right, exactly. So from here, you can then outbound, you know, we bring it in, we do the signal processing, and then you click, okay, I, wanna, I want the filtered data and I want to send it via this protocol there. And then you set up the stream and you send it out. So in the case of the robot hand, we were looking at the EMG actually from the head and we were mapping the EMG signals from the head to the actuation of the robot arm, which was powered by an Arduino and some other electronics. Mm -hmm. um, so these are all examples of things that you can do. You know, you could send it to Unity for doing 3D content. You could send it to Max MSP for doing audio. There's a whole suite of uh, open source biosensing software applications for doing like machine learning and classification for building like emotional profiles and things like that. Um, yeah, and this, you know, the, the whole idea with OpenBCI is just to make the, the acquisition and, and networking process as easy as possible. Yeah. Where, where, do you, where do you see then um, the most uh, use of OpenBCI right now? Is it, is it people observing their biosignals on your software from wearing it? Um, is it them all, like, are a decent amount of people also trying to control physical objects with, um, like we saw there? Yep. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, at this point, you know, the majority of OpenBCI users are in the research realm. So they're, so they're you know, they're collecting data and, you know, contextualized data. They're running experiments and they're looking at EEG or, or, or brain data in the context of something. So sleep research or attention deficit disorder or, um, you know, the like, what else can, you know, th there are people who are working with it for prosthetics, kind of like the controlling the robot arm. So you could tap into, you know, residual muscle data of the, of the forearm or the bicep and then use it to power prosthetics. So long story short, uh, people are using OpenBCI for like so many different things. Um, and it's, it's actually hard for us to keep track of like yeah. what our market actually is because we have students that are using it to like learn what, what neuroscience is and you know, what EEG signals look like, kind of like what I was showing you for the first time. And then we have like 
the top consumer technology companies in the world, like I won't name names, but a lot of them, most of them have purchased OpenBCI gear and are probably using it for R&D for next generation product design. Mm-hmm. Um, which is an interesting topic that maybe we should touch on, which Let's is do like, it. Yeah, you know, right now. Wh- yeah. you know, where are we headed? Like, what is the future of yes. BCI? And, and, you know, what do we have to look forward to? And what do we have to be, you know, potentially afraid of? Um, you know, and what should we, you know, we, we mentioned it in the beginning of the conversation, like what, what should we design around? What, what you know, what, what little dystopian, dystopian black mirror scenarios should we be like, yeah, not that. Yeah. And let's make sure that like, the river splits there, and, mm-hmm. and we're 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 on that path. That's a good path. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. Um, so what is that then? What is that future? The the two things that scare me most about the the potential and the implication, you know, the, the you know what BCI could do are um, its impact on technology addiction, uh, and also social stratification. Yeah. So I think you know, you know, health is another ethical concern. Uh, you know, are these things safe? I mean, I think technology addiction falls into that. Um, but, you know, I, I really don't think that we're going to be in, invasively implanting electrodes anytime soon. You know, like Elon Musk talks about Neuralink and, and you know, there are other companies that are looking to fast track putting sensors into the brain. But I think that we've barely tapped into the potential of non-invasive brain, mm-hmm. brain computer interfacing. and. Uh, non-invasive BCI, by, by non-invasive, I mean like outside of the skin, outside of the skull, yeah. is I believe going to become a ubiquitous technology. Mm. Um, and not just EEG, but biosensing in general. <clears throat> Basically like not, not necessarily understanding the brain, but the mind. Getting back to the beginning of the conversation, it's like we don't really care about the brain. We care about the software inside of the brain. We care about the, the processes and understanding what makes you who you are, which is like your cognition, your thoughts, your emotions, you know, that's like, that's what matters really. Um, so maybe we should be called open MCI, mind computer interface, mind but computer interface. <laughs> too late now. Uh, <laughs> anyway, but like, you know, getting back to your question, like, you know, the two things I really am concerned about are uh, technology addiction and social stratification. Um, in mind control. As mind well. control. Yeah. And, you know, and so in a, to, to a degree that is technology, technology it, addiction, mm-hmm. right? Like we, even now, technology and applications on your phone are so addictive. That they're controlling us. That they're controlling us. Yeah. The, you know, they're capturing our attention and they're taking us away from, you know. Other meaningful endeavors. Exactly, and interactions with people, you know, like social media is this like, social band-aid where we get this like immediate kind of fix like oh people like me people care about me but you know in doing that it's taking your time away from um investing in real relationships where like if if you were in trouble or if you were uh you know if you needed emotional support you could call up your best friend and be like hey man we got to hang out because i got to talk to you yeah you know it's like and, and i think people are losing that to a certain degree relying on like casting this wide social net yeah, yeah. um anyway that's that's a whole other let's let's yeah. hit let's hit on this yeah. so you were here at the augmented world expo yeah. Aww. And you were seeing a lot of HMDs head mounted displays, like the yep. um, like the Hololenses and stuff. Yep. And so you see a future also where brain computer interfaces are intertwined with these head mounted displays. I, I do. Yes. I, I think that the future of computation will uh, feature the combination of um, uh, artif- augmented reality, so essentially displays that are overlaid on top of our real world environment, artificial intelligence. So machine learning and algorithms that are understanding and optimizing your experience in the background, and then brain computer interfacing, mm. <clears throat> or more, you know, kind of more broadly, multimodal mind computer interfacing. Mm. So eye tracking, measuring your heart rate, your heart rate variability, mm. looking at your brain data, but building this complex physiological representation of you, right? Um, so, you know, that information is what's going to be fed into computers. Uh, and to the, a, the machine learning and the, artif- the AI algorithms that are optimizing and, and altering your experience that you perceive through a screen in front of your face and audio that's on your ears at all times. You know, and, that, and that will be at the core of the future of computers. 
and you know, ACI plus AI plus AR. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and AR, you know, pick whatever acronym yeah, you yeah, want, correct. XR, AR, but like we will reach a point where digital content is always not just on a little screen in our hand, but like overlaid into the real world. And ideally we'll have the ability to opt out and like have your normal yeah. conversations. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. I, yeah, ideally it's <laughs> like it's like we can't just, you know, force indigenous people on the planet to yeah, right. yeah like yeah, you, there's Yeah, yeah. I mean like it, it will happen, but I, I do think that, you know A lot of people will choose to tap in. A lot yeah. of people will choose to tap in. Yeah. And, and at that point And live there even right. yeah, all the time. All the time. Yeah. Like and at that point, who is ultimately in control over the content? The controllers of the substrate, right? That you go into, right? And so this is one of my, you know, one of the things that we really, I believe, we really need to start thinking about critically, which is that little AI agent in the background mm -hmm. that's receiving all of your biological information yes. in the context of what you're looking at, exactly. where you are, yes. what you're touching in the real world or in the virtual world. You know, that is extremely valuable cool. and vulnerable data. And Google and. Uh, Baidu and Tencent, Alibaba, Facebook, Facebook you know. Apple, Amazon, Microsoft yep. are all racing as fast as they can to try and create the monopoly that that, that, that houses that data, that houses the operating that, yeah. system of the mind. Right when when the, the the human mind becomes this core data set in a computer, which we're trending towards for sure. Yeah, yes, who owns yes. that mind? You. Yeah or the people who built the tool to house it, right? Yeah. And I think that this is like, you know, this is the single greatest question that drives me as an entrepreneur, which is like, you know, how do we stake out that future so that user agency, like you as the user in this system are the primary agent in control of the priorities of that system. Like this system is not being prioritized to send you the best ads that are most likely to yeah. for you to click on and look overlay it on the wall and be like oh that's great yeah, 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 you yeah. know but like how do you like control this you know this 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 ai agent in the background and make sure that the priorities are aligned with you as an individual yes. Yes. um that's the big question of our time it's a massive question of our time yep. yeah and yeah this century is going to be about that a lot of this century is going to be about that yep um so <clears throat> I'm really glad that you're um, passionate about teaching about the importance of that. And um, as you build out the democratization of the technology, uh, hopefully it also gets um, young people, uh, like we saw at the very beginning, um, excited about talking more about these pressing questions instead of it just happening to them, but right. rather they get a stake because they actually understand how it's all working. They get a stake in the global conversation about how to prevent the oops scenarios. Yeah. When we have such ancient minds and bodies that are playing with godlike technologies, that's where we have the issues of civilizations collapsing. Right. So we do not want to repeat that again as we move into the future. Yeah. Um, what are some of the... <clears throat> What are some of the other things that you think we may have? Um, did we miss stuff that you think super important to mention about OpenBCI? Um, so, I mean, a kind of a, an extension of the topic we were just on <clears throat> in, in terms of integration with HMDs and AR. Mm -hmm. This summer, we're going to be, you know, it's a challenging endeavor that we're embarking on, but we're trying, we're going we're to um, create a, an add on for AR and VR, nice. which will have integrated sensors and the goal is to um, basically build this rich multimodal, multimodal uh, sensor fusion add-on for VR, yeah, and then have that supported by a kind of a basic 3D SDK and pr probably in Unity or, or Unreal, um, and, and then provide this to the world and just say like, okay, so I'm yep. wearing my VR headset, and I, and instead of me needing to to uh, move around the the joysticks and stuff. I'm literally just thinking to move forward stuff like that I think it, it'll be a combination of the two. Like yeah, a, it will, know, yeah <clears throat> hybrid of yeah, yeah, yeah. You know like a, the hand gestures and haptic gloves and things like that are gonna be critical for AR and VR. Yes, but the you know Building an SDK for the OS of the mind uh -huh. and, exp and and putting that in the hands of as many people as possible I think is one of the, if, you know, I don't know if this is the correct solution, but I know it is 
in my mind, it's, it's a step in the right direction is like, you know, if, if we can take the innovation and move it out of the proverbial ivory tower and just put it into the hands of everyone, then it, then like, you know, it, it, you know, when, if, and when Facebook or whoever creates this kind of master tool that has, you know, uh, direct access to your mind, you know, I, I think it's better that that technology is owned by everyone. And, and, and that innovation is taking place in many different places at the same time, as opposed to in like, you know, the three, you know, highest, uh, you know, highest budget companies in the world. Um, you know, and that's part of the reason we're doing it is like, hey, like, let's just put this out there and let everyone have access to it. Um, so that people understand it, they understand the risks, they understand the benefits, yeah, yeah. and like, you know, the IP is, is not isolated and owned by a single company. So it's a wisdom race that we're going through, and if yep. you can get the human uh, OS of the mind uh, open sourced um, through a, like an SDK out, um, potentially it can inspire more of the democratization, the conversation that we need um, to stake out the error scenarios collectively, um, and also have a, like an inclusive stakeholding in our future where everyone is uh, interdependently interconnected and intertwined with the um, stakes that we hold within the organizations. That yep. we're moving in that direction from the triangle to the circle. We need to move there faster to get the wisdom race successfully. I like um, that yeah, triangle to circle. circle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> the meat of the we yeah yep. yeah connor this has been such a good episode i want to hit a couple quick questions on the way out sure. um ron isn't a big fan of this one but i like asking it what what happens pre-birth and post-death pre-birth and post-death um so um pre pre-birth you know we are yeah i guess like you know from the moment that you become a little you know, nugget in your mom's belly, right? Your, you know, your heart starts beating. Um, your brain starts, you know, the gears, the clockwork starts ticking. <clears throat> um, you know, you're alive, you know, especially later in the pregnancy. Um, Where do you think we come from before that? Even? Before that? Yeah. Um, man, that's a good one. You know, we're just, we're just energy, you know, conservation. We're just, we're just energy. Come, you know, we, 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 it's not like we flicker out of nothing. We, you know, we, it's, it's, yeah, that's a tough question. Yeah. But on the other <laughs> side, you know, yeah. I, I do like to think um, that there is something beyond death. Uh, my grandpa actually just passed away last week, um, which was, Damn. it was, it was a tough experience. Um, but I also, it was definitely his time. Yeah, um, yeah. Grandpa Jim, James Leader. Uh, loved him. He was a great grandfather, um, but he was the uh, the husband of my grandma, who I was talking about earlier in the episode, um, who passed away from the the neurodegenerative yes. disease. So he had a rather tragic, uh, you know, last ten years of his life because uh, shortly after my grandma passed away, within the week afterwards, he had a stroke, um, and. You know, it, that was kind of the beginning of the end for him. It was a series of, like, he had another stroke not too long after that. Um, you know, so I like to think that they're now back together again. You know, somewhere, mm -hmm. whether it's energy flowing through, you know, the, the stars or whatever, I like to think that now they, they, they've been reunited. Um, but, you know, I don't think death is the end. I think it's just a... a a gateway to the next chapter to maybe so. another beginning potentially yeah. yeah what do you think we're alone in the cosmos no definitely not 100 percent no <laughs> and then do you think we're in a simulation possibly i mean I, I honestly think that we are have you ever looked at like the 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 largest scale of um galaxies and and Lania Kea is mm -hmm. like the, the is the the spine of galaxy formations that we're inside of and we have this picture that's slightly bigger than Lania Kea mm -hmm. look it up but like it looks like at the at the largest scale neurons yeah the brain yeah. I like to think that we're this tiny little speck inside of some other organism's brain <laughs> 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 and that somewhere in my brain and in your brain exists the same complexity of like a universe yeah. inside of a universe inside of a universe. Fractals all the way up and down. All the <laughs> way up and down. 
And I, I like to think that like people think that the human like mind can be reverse engineered, and I am like firmly uh, like the human brain maybe, but like my consciousness infinitely complex, same as yours. And I think that there's like little universes inside of us that can spark to life and influence and call, create a ripple effect all the way through my mind. And like, you know, this is just this is my like fantastical yeah. view of the complexity of the universe and all the other universes that are within it and outside of it. Um, what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? The most beautiful thing in the world? My girlfriend. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I had to say that. Uh, <laughs> uh, the most beautiful thing in the world. Um, let's see. It's a good one. I mean, I think it's got to be the human mind. It's, it's um, you know, and I say the mind very distinctly uh, from, you know, f uh, separate from the human brain um, because it's infinitely complex. And, and um, yeah, it's, it's, I don't think we'll ever fully understand it and that makes it beautiful. Um, that and the vastness of the universe. So it's, it's, uh, it's a hard, you know, but I like to, you know, this is more personal, so it's, uh, I, I pick that. And I don't mean my mind. My mind is not yeah, the yeah. most beautiful. I just mean, like, the human mind is, yeah. a, is a beautiful thing. So, Carter, this has been such a great episode. <laughs> Thank you for Alan, coming it's been out. great. It's yeah. been really fun. We loved having you on. Yep. Thank you so much for coming Thank on. Huge thank you to everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. We would love for you to check out the links also to openbci.com, also their Twitter. Definitely get talking to more people, get playing with the style of technology, for your friends, your families, coworkers, people online on social media. Get talking more about the democratization of brain computer interfaces. Go and start actually playing with them yourself. Think about all of the great aspects of research that we can do with these. So get playing with the Legos of neuroscience. Yes. And also, Support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the organizations around the world that you believe in. Support Simulation. Our links are below. Help us grow and prosper. Huge shout out to Ron Vogus for producing and Thank directing. You, Thank you, Ron. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Peace.